This is Land of Havilah, Exodus 12a. At the time of the Exodus, God had more on His mind than just the drama between Moses and Pharaoh. He had our deliverance by Christ on His mind. How do we know that? By the institution of the Passover coming up. Verse 1, Yahweh spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be to you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Comment to the Hebrews, a month was one full cycle of the moon, which is 29 or 30 days. A calendar day started at onset of darkness and ran to the following onset of darkness. Yahweh says, I'm going to initiate a new calendar, the Hebrew calendar. Arrange it so that this month will be the first month of the year. He was speaking of the springtime, that the year would start in the spring, in what we would call March or April. God puts appointments on His calendar, appointments known only to Himself. Quote, it isn't for you to know the times and seasons which the Father has set within His own authority, Acts 1-7. But no one knows of that day or hour, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only, Matthew 24 36. So God keeps things up His sleeve on His calendar. He said right from Genesis chapter 1 that He made the heavenly bodies in part to keep time. Quote, Let them be for signs to mark seasons, days, and years. Genesis 1.14 So He's the originator of the heavenly bodies that mark the days and years and the originator of the Hebrew calendar, which is based on the sun and moon He created. And coming up, He wants Israel to keep strict account of a certain day on the yearly calendar as an annual observance because one year in the distant future, on the calendar day he's about to name, he's going to make something big happen. He wants Israel to start celebrating that day now, about 1,400 years in advance of the event. Yahweh says to Moses, verse 3, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household, and if the household's too little for a lamb, then he and his neighbor next to his house shall take one according to the number of the souls, according to what everyone can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Comment, Yahweh says, take a lamb on the tenth of this month, one lamb per household, or if your household's too small to eat an entire lamb, get together with your neighbors. He didn't say eat it on the tenth day of the month, he said take it, meaning select it on the tenth. As much as there was going on already between Moses and Pharaoh and the plagues, only Yahweh could have such a grasp of the big picture to come up with a new calendar and a new observance right now. Verse 5, Your lamb shall be without defect, a male a year old. You shall take it from the sheep or from the goats. Comment, This observance is going to be an oxymoron. It will be solemn, but at the same time celebratory, a solemn celebration. It's an observance of the day of crucifixion, which on one hand solemn for the horror of it, but on the other hand celebratory for what it will accomplish. The Lamb foreshadows Christ. Christ is the Lamb of God. This comes from many verses in both the Old and New Testaments. When John the Baptist laid eyes on Jesus, he said, quote, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John 1, Abraham unknowingly pointed to this when he said to Isaac, quote, God will provide Himself the Lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Genesis 22, 8. Revelation calls Christ the Lamb 30 times, all the way up to the last chapter, chapter 22, verse 3, which indicates the Lamb will sit on the throne for eternity. Acts 8, verse 32, which is a quote from Isaiah, chapter 53, says, quote, As a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he doesn't open his mouth, end quote. This refers to Jesus being silent during His trial and crucifixion, as predicted by Isaiah hundreds of years before it happened. These are just a few of the over 100 references to sacrificial lambs in the Bible, all of which we now know refer to the coming Christ, or to Christ after He came. But the mystery of all this wasn't revealed until Jesus was crucified and the Holy Spirit brought understanding of it. Paul calls it, quote, the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the children of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit, end quote. So the prophets of the Old Testament didn't fully understand what they were saying 
and didn't understand the predictive and prophetic nature of what God was commanding them to say and do. The Passover lamb that each household will sacrifice foreshadows the coming Christ. God had the entire picture in mind from start to finish when he instituted the Passover. In verse 5, Yahweh says, The lamb shall be without defect. This refers to Jesus being without sin. 1 Peter 1, 19 and 20 calls Christ a lamb without blemish or spot, who was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but not revealed until this last age. Speaking of the lamb that shall be selected on the 10th, verse 6, And you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at evening. Comment, so they're going to select the lamb on the 10th, keep it till the 14th, then kill it at evening. This means that the lamb's known ahead of time. This is in reference to God choosing Christ ahead of time, planning the crucifixion in advance. It's also in reference to Jesus being killed by those who knew him. If we had to make a guess, what would be the most appropriate day of the year for Jesus to be crucified to confirm that he was God's Passover lamb according to God's planning? Would that day be Passover, maybe? Or the day of preparation for Passover? Indeed, that's exactly when Christ was crucified according to all four Gospels. Amazing coincidence or hand of God? The scripture leaves no doubt it was the hand of God that caused Jesus to be crucified on Passover. That's why God was so specific about establishing the Hebrew calendar the way he did and establishing the date on which the Passover should take place. He knew he would cause Christ to be crucified on that same date around 1,400 years later. Verse 7, They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel on the houses in which they shall eat it. Comment, they're to put some of the lamb's blood on their doorposts and lintel. In explanation, the door at the entry of each home has a post to support the door on both sides and a post across the top, which is the lintel. They'll apply the blood on the doorposts and lintel so it's visible from the outside. This will distinguish their homes from the Egyptian homes so that when the death angel passes by during the night to kill the firstborn in every home, When the death angel sees the blood, he'll pass over that home. The blood will save the firstborn in the Israelites' homes from death, as the blood of Christ saves us. Verse 8, They shall eat the meat in that night roasted with fire and unleavened bread. They shall eat it with bitter herbs. Comment, unleavened bread is bread without yeast. It's flat bread, something like a tortilla, not spongy bread with air holes in it. Leavened bread takes time to knead and rise, but unleavened bread can be made quickly. Unleavened bread was appropriate for the Exodus where they had to eat quickly and move on, and while camping they had no time to make leavened bread. This underscores that time will be of the essence in making the Exodus. They'll basically have one day to escape the immediate vicinity. After that, the opportunity will be lost. So the unleavened bread foreshadows the urgency of our salvation. We need to get it done now in the short window of opportunity we have. Unleavened bread also foreshadows that there's no need to clutter our lives with the unnecessary, with anything that would distract our attention from our primary goal, which is to make a successful exodus from sin to salvation. Leavens anything that hinders us in our Christian walk. During Passovers of the future, the bitter herbs will be a reminder of the bitter captivity in Egypt. There's bitterness also in the need to sacrifice a little lamb, which foreshadowed the bitter need for Christ to make a sacrifice of himself. God knew the crucifixion was coming, and he planned the Passover to foreshadow various aspects of the gospel. Even before creation, God knew the crucifixion was coming. 1 Peter 1, 19 and 20. Verse 9. Don't eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted with fire, with its head, its legs, and its inner parts. You shall let nothing of it remain until morning, but that which remains of it until the morning you shall burn with fire. This is how you shall eat it, with your belt on your waist, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is Yahweh's Passover. Comment. That was the first mention of the name of the observance. It's Yahweh's Passover. And verse 11 is to be eaten in haste. The essential elements of the meal are lamb, unleavened bread, and bitter herbs. 
is to be eaten in haste, fully clothed and ready to travel, wearing a belt, shoes, and holding a staff in one hand, and eating with the other hand. This is not a leisurely meal. It's getting some quick fuel on board for the trip. For Christians, as we partake of Christ, we're stoking up on fuel for our escape from this world to the next. Why did God pointedly say it should be roasted with fire, don't eat it raw, don't boil it? It's because this is an offering to God. Sacrifices were offered by fire. Jesus was a sacrifice. He offered himself to God for our salvation as the final Passover lamb. And why did God say, let nothing remain of it until morning, but that which remains burn with fire, so there's nothing left? This foreshadows Jesus being resurrected. There was nothing left of him. Verse 12, For I will go through the land of Egypt in that night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and animal. Against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am Yahweh. The blood shall be to you for a token on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood I'll pass over you, and there shall no plague be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Comment, the blood of the Passover lamb and the necessity of applying it to the home foreshadows the necessity of us applying the blood of Christ to ourselves by faith. If we don't apply the blood of Jesus to ourselves by faith, we'll die an eternal death. With the blood applied to us, when we come to the day of judgment, no harm will come to us. The Lamb's blood saved the Israelite firstborns, and Christ's blood saves us. Verse 14. This day shall be to you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to Yahweh. Throughout your generations you shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put away yeast out of your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. Comment. As Yahweh already said, the Passover meal shall be on the fourteenth day of the first month of the year, at evening, it should be eaten with unleavened bread. Starting then, verse 15 says, No leavened bread should be eaten for the next seven days. Also, there should be no leaven anywhere in the house. This will be the week of unleavened bread. Loosely, the entire week will be known as Passover. Passover is a multi-layered term. It could refer to the meal or to the passing over of the death angel on the night of the 14th or to the entire calendar day of the 14th or to the seven-day period of unleavened bread from the 14th to the 21st. The first Passover was unique because it celebrated deliverance from Egypt before the deliverance happened. Every Passover before the crucifixion would be marked by the same oddity that it would solemnly celebrate the crucifixion about 1,400 times before the crucifixion happened. Israel celebrated the first Passover under terrible conditions of slavery but it was still a celebration because of God's word that deliverance would come. We can celebrate no matter what the conditions as well because God's promises are sure. He'll come through on everything. We can celebrate based on all the good things he's already manifested to us and all the good things he said he will do. We celebrate because if he said it, it's already done. Exodus 12b is next at landofhavilah.net. Exodus 12b.